areas where climate change has a frankly enormous impact today, but doesn't really get talked about much is national security, defense. Yep, the military and the nation's security. You may not realize it, but climate and energy each play a major role in a range of issues, from how we fuel the military to the safety of military bases and military personnel, to how, where, and why troops are deployed, and even how conflicts start. As we face a pivotal election and two presidential candidates with polar opposite views on climate change, energy, and national security, especially, and even after they're elected, it is critical to talk about this issue. So today we're going to dive into climate change, energy, and national security with a former top defense undersecretary who literally wrote the book on it. So put on your earbuds, turn up the volume, and prepare to take notes because our discussion might open your eyes to the full impact of climate change in ways that, frankly, you haven't really thought about. Welcome to Electric Ladies Podcast. We share stories, insights, tips, and advice from remarkably innovative women working on the front lines of corporate responsibility, energy, sustainability, climate, and ESG-related issues. I'm your host, Joan Michelson. We talk about innovation, leadership, technologies, and careers, always bringing a new perspective. Find us anywhere you like to listen to podcasts, on our website, electricladiespodcast.com, and through my Forbes articles as well. And please pass it on to your friends and leave us a five-star review. It helps other people find us. If you are at an inflection point to yourself looking for support with your ESG work or your career, please reach out to me. In all of this chaos swirling around us, there are a lot of opportunities and we don't want you to be flailing. So you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn at Joan Michelson and let me know no matter what industry you're in. This episode is brought to you by Competent Boards, a comprehensive training program for board directors and aspiring board directors. I'm faculty there, by the way, and I also have their sustainability and ESG designation certification. So I know from whence I speak. Uh, It's a great group of people, gives you the skills, strategic perspective, and confidence needed for today's boardrooms, especially on the issues we talk about on Electric Ladies podcast. You can find it at competentboards.com. The United States Department of Defense is the largest consumer of energy in the United States and one of the largest energy consumers in the world. It's the largest energy consumer in the federal government, as you would guess, with 72%. That's a huge of the the federal government's energy use. And it's frankly, therefore, also the world's largest emitter of carbon emissions. The DOD spent $14.5 billion in fiscal year 2022 to provide installations around the world with energy, and that includes operations and training to handle energy issues. Furthermore, the DOD budgeted $32.4 billion in fiscal year 2024 on projects with the Energy Department, that might surprise you, that help the Defense Department. Each branch of the military has an assistant secretary of energy installations and environment. I interviewed one of them previously, assistant secretary of the Army uh, for energy installations and environment, Catherine Hammack at Pentagon a few years ago. And then there's the impact of climate change on the military in so many ways that I think will surprise you. My guest today began her book on this important topic with a quote from our current Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, himself a retired four-star general. Uh, And he said, quote, today, no nation can find lasting security without addressing the climate crisis. We face all kinds of threats in our line of work, but few of them truly deserve to be called existential. The climate crisis does, close quote. So let's find out why Secretary Austin thinks addressing the climate crisis is an existential threat to national security. I'd like you to meet Sherry Goodman, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, the first person to hold that title, by the way, and the author of the new book, 
Threat Multiplier, Climate, Military Leadership, and the Fight for Global Security. Sherry is personally responsible, by the way, for putting the impact of the environment on the radar of the defense industry. And she's currently Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security and Vice Chair of the International Security Advisory Board, reporting to the Secretary of State. Uh, I could, if I took all the time to go through her entire bio, we'd be here all day. So I'm just going to give you a couple of other highlights. She received the Department of Defense Distinguished Service Award twice, had so many prestigious national security positions and board seats. You all have to look them up online. She earned her bachelor's degree at Amherst College, her law degree from Harvard Law School, and a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and picked up a couple of honorary doctorates along the way. Full disclosure, Sherry is a friend I've known for many years. I had her on the show previously a while back, and her new book is vital for any leader today. So I'm thrilled to have Sherry Goodman back on Electric Ladies Podcast. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you for coming back. Great to be with you, Joan. Thank you. So congratulations on the book. It's amazing. If you can see me on video, there it is, and we'll have a, a link to it. But Let's start with your explaining the book title, Threat Multiplier, because I think it really sums up the case that you're making well. And by the way, feel free to correct anything I got wrong in the introduction. <laughs> well, Threat Multiplier is the term I coined in 2007, working with the first group of generals and admirals to assess the national security implications of climate change. Uh, which I organized during that period. And after a year with the nation's leading climate scientists and national security and intelligence professionals, we knew that climate change would affect our global security and that it would lead to instability in fragile regions of the world. And so in trying to frame to frame the concept of climate as a security issue and communicate it more broadly, um, I coined the phrase threat multiplier, which has uh, come to really stand for the connection between climate change and national security. We know today that uh, it not only amplifies threats around the world, but affects us here at home as we face ever higher temperatures, rising sea levels, stronger storms, and persistent wildfires, among many other climate threats. Yeah, it definitely multiplies the other threats, right? So, um, and it comes from the origin of force multiplier, right? That the the military uses. Yes, it's a it's a uh, a play on the term force multiplier, which is commonly used to convey how a technology or a new system can provide more military effectiveness. A good example would be uh, stealth in the nineteen nineties or GPS, or um, night vision goggles, all of those, or today uh, AI, all of those provide force multiplier to our effectiveness on the battlefield. Threat multiplier conveys that climate acts on every other threat we face, whether it's strategic competition with Russia and China, or terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, uh, biological threats, um, and other threats around the world uh, from uh, malign actors and the like that our forces are deployed uh, to address, this is making it all the more complicated because it's destabilizing our natural systems. Uh, and when and the whole goal of security is stability. So now we face not only instability in human systems, in governance, weak and failed states, but also instability and an inability to rely on the past to predict the future. Oh, that's very, thank you for that. That's really helpful. I love that idea. The goal of national security is stability. Um, if only we lived in such a world, right? Um, you say in the book, and you kind of alluded to this just now in your comments that, uh, but you say, quote, climate change would fundamentally shift the world's geopolitics demanding new diplomatic strategies, new energy strategies for powering the forces, and new approaches to protecting bases from natural disasters, close quote. I get that because of 
massive amounts of fuel uh, that it takes to run the bases now that that when service members are in theater and they're driving trucks right uh, oil tankers to and from the bases they're sitting ducks and that puts them at tremendous risk and obviously there's extreme weather risks to the bases themselves um hurricanes tornadoes wildfires etc and you mentioned a bit of that but and they and the community you know just as they put the communities that those bases are in at risk bases at risk right but how does climate change fundamentally shift geopolitics? Well, let me give you a few examples. First is creating whole new regions that we have to defend and protect. Take the Arctic. Uh, this was a region until the climate era, uh, which was largely ice covered and where defense and deterrence uh, meant submarines and some missiles. Now it's increasingly opened with retreating sea ice, rising temperatures, and thawing and collapsing permafrost. Uh, it's an area for global competition uh, for the resources and riches that can be found there or for the future transportation routes. And President Putin of Russia eyes the vast northern sea route that hugs the shallow Russian coastline as a toll road for transportation from ports in Asia to ports in Europe. And China, oh, by the way, sees itself as a near Arctic stakeholder with rights to access minerals, energy, and perhaps in the future fish, as well as shipping routes. So that's just an, one example of a whole new region of geostrategic competition uh, created by a changing climate. Uh, in other parts of the world, we face prolonged drought, particularly in the equatorial regions of Africa and uh, parts of Latin America and parts of Asia. And as those regions become more intensely um, subject to prolonged drought from climate change, uh, many populations become vulnerable to food and water insecurity, not enough food, not enough water. Farmers and herders find themselves in conflict over access to food and water. Uh, driving populations either to migrate or move to cities, which can lead to civil unrest, as it did some years ago in Syria, uh, combined with authoritarian other rulers taking advantage of those populations. So that's a second way in which resources become almost weaponized, uh, particularly water, during the climate crisis. A third way is the growing intensity of typhoons and storm and hurricanes and extreme weather events around the world, uh, particularly in Asia's disaster alley, uh, where increasingly our forces are responding uh, to natural disasters and humanitarian assistance in the wake of populations being disrupted from Bangladesh, Philippines, Vietnam, and beyond. And it's harder and harder to recover as each next time there's less resilience in the society. That can lead to long-term disruption. Uh, and in certain areas of um, the Pacific Island nations and even some Caribbean nations could be subject to nation extinction in the future uh, as parts of their atolls become uninhabitable from sea level rise and loss of fresh water. Then there's a question of where do they go uh, what are their sovereign rights uh, once they can no longer inhabit that? But do they still own the, their exclusive economic zones? So there's a whole range of geostrategic questions that are arising uh, with climate change. Wow, thank you. There's a lot in that to unpack, and we'll get through some of it. Um, I want to just address... Um, before we get into some of those other issues, the the issue of the actual basis, because I think people listening, they they know people in the military and they know people who might be on military base X, Y, Z, right? When I interviewed Secretary Hammack at the Pentagon, she was tasked with implementing the Army's net zero strategy. And that was to transition the Army to zero net zero emissions. She talked about how the bases were sharing energy, water, and waste infrastructures with the communities they were based in, for example, um, and of course, using increasing amounts of renewable energy like solar panels, et cetera, um, and as well as using more electric vehicles and things. 
the DOD today has a climate adaptation plan. It does climate risk analyses and even has the climate resilience portal, I noticed. Um, and I was fascinated that the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, talked about 27 million acres of land, water, and airspace that the DOD has its control. That's enormous. So how does the Defense Department actually get to net zero? The, the goal is by 2050, which I realize is, you know, several years away, but it's a process and that's an enormous task. So how do you, how does the Defense Department actually get from billions of dollars in energy costs a year and uh, tons of, of uh, carbon emissions to net zero in 25 years? Well, Joan, here's where I think the military is leading by example, and we will see communities around the nation um, adopt many of the same strategies that DOD and our military is today. To get to net zero by 2050, you have to have a lot of ambition and you've got to act now. Uh, one of the ways our bases, which are highly vulnerable in certain areas to climate risk from sea level rise to wildfires, and also loss of energy if the grid goes down or is attacked, and they need to be able to operate 24-7, our soldiers, sailor, airmen, and marine can't afford to lose power. So to ensure both uh, energy resilience and to address the climate crisis, military bases today are installing microgrids at most of our major bases. And that's one of the tools. It's not, there's a number of tools to, um, in, in, the, uh, in the toolkit now to move to net zero. On a microgrid, you can then put on some renewable energy sources, wind or solar, some bases like Marine Corps Base Albany, the first military base to be fully net zero, also has a waste energy plant. Uh, and they're partnering with the community so that the community gets the benefits too. Uh, and so, and then better batteries and long-term energy storage. So all of this is coming uh, and those innovations are being modeled by activities that are occurring on a number of military bases. At Fort Liberty in North Carolina, there's a very large solar floating array uh, that also helps protect the land, Put the putting the solar onto Big Muddy Lake. Uh, and this floating solar array will help power um, a very important critical infrastructure at the base and is also working again uh, with the local community and the local utilities to provide that resilient power. So there are a number of innovations occurring across mil at military bases across the country. And as we say sometimes, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, in 2018, uh, Hurricane Michael damaged quite a bit of Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, taking the roofs off the hangars for the F-35 uh, fighter. And now that base is being rebuilt as a resilient, climate resilient base of the future by the Air Force. So, and that will have both natural and a more resilient infrastructure to withstand higher winds. It will have improved energy systems and it will and it also be moving towards a net zero footprint. Wow. Okay. I can see how you say that it could be a model for what uh, maybe the private sector might want to do, right? That's that's extraordinary. I have a million questions on that, but I'll I'll try to stay. But all of these are public private partnerships. All of this is being done are with companies really? oh, okay. in in the private sector. Um, and another innovation, you know, we're also looking at the next generation of small modular and micro reactors. Um, and an Air Force base in Alaska will have one um, later this decade. And that will also begin the next generation of clean power uh, for uh, remote base power operations. Yeah, nuclear is a, the small the SMRs are really critical. You know, you mentioned um, uh, the troop deployment, which is really interesting. And uh, issue, which was one of the things I remember surprised me when I first started looking at this issue that I think a lot of people don't think about, is that the, the, the D now has to budget, not just for normal operations, but 
to predict how they might need to deploy troops to disaster areas. And we even saw this during COVID, right, where you had troops put up makeshift hospitals and parking lots or Central Park or whatever, right? So we call upon the amazing skill of the military all the time for all kinds of disasters. But you mentioned this a minute ago, and I want to make sure that people understand this, that it's not, yes, it's the bases and things like that, but it's also talent. It's also figuring out how do you, how does the DOD do that kind of calculation? We know, I mean, we know that there's going to be more hurricanes and more ferocious ones, right? And and I guess they know where they've had to go and you're point about South Asia having repeated typhoons, et cetera, is, is interesting and how it gets worse each time. But how do you figure that out? How do you talk about the, the troop deployment issue for natural disasters and how that um, gets factored into the, to the budget? What kind of an impact that might have on the defense budget? Well, one important way that the Department of Defense is going after that increased need to respond to uh, climate driven events is to do war games and simulations uh, both in the U.S. and in regions around the world to understand how climate is driving extreme weather events and storms and the need to deploy forces either to support Americans first and foremost. Now, for example, today we have the National Guard called up in Louisiana because we have a hurricane there. And of course, we've had National Guard called up uh, in every state of the country in response to fires, floods, hurricanes. Uh, and we now have, as our the head of the National Guard uh, says, we now have a fire season that lasts year round. And we spend person days now on fighting fires, uh, supporting our uh, brave local firefighters at about 10 times the rate that we did just five years ago. So this is something that's happening real time. To train for it, you do simulations and war games, and then you put it put it into your training. And then, oh, by the way, you really have to look at what kind of uh, equipment you have uh, for your forces and how you protect your personnel. Uh, because today, increasingly, we, our forces have to operate in hotter and colder environments, hotter environments uh, from fires or deployments in parts of the world where temperatures are extremely high and unhealthy. We have more black flag days to now. Those are days when the temperature, wet bulb temperature of combination of heat and humidity is above 95 degrees. And it's unsafe uh, for troops to train or to be deployed for a length of time. So uh, in the 90s, we talked about um, how we had to own the night with night vision goggles. And now our Deputy Secretary of Defense talks about how you have to own the heat and be able to uh, operate in those hotter temperatures, new kinds of uniforms, different training routines, uh, different types of maybe lighter equipment. Uh, and then at the same time, we also have to operate in the Arctic in ways that we stopped doing after the Cold War, uh, when that region became an era, uh, experienced an era of uh, science cooperation uh, and now has given way to an era where while that's still vitally important and understanding those sci scientifically those changes, we have to be prepared to have forces operating in that region and we need new equipment uh, and, and new uh, provisions for our personnel. I bet. Um, I have spent, uh, had the privilege of spending a couple of weeks in Iceland um, over the last few years and gotten to know a lot of those uh, folks there in the Arctic communities. Um, bless you. I think uh, you probably know, you you may remember that I emceed the Arctic uh, Atlantic Council um, Iceland Clean Energy Summit uh, with leadership breakfast that, that turned out you attended, which was really fun with a lot of the, the Prime Minister of Iceland and a lot of other dignitaries in the White House. So, I remember yeah, that they, well, Joan, and you were you were great at that. And I had the privilege of, I've had the privilege of being in Iceland three times now, just most recently this summer, and in Greenland, where you really meet the climate future. In Greenland, you can see the great vast Jakobshavn glacier melting at an ever increasing clip. You could hear the sounds uh, of of the ice 
uh, sheets carving off uh, into the water. And it's really um, melting now at a rate faster than even predicted by climate scientists. And so that could alone could in decades hence raise global sea levels, even along the East Coast. And so as we say, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think I saw in preparing for this that there were 1,700 bases, is that correct, that are potentially at risk from sea level rise that I think the Deputy Secretary Hicks talked about. But you mentioned a minute ago the war games and simulations. You talk in the book a lot about um climate intelligence and climate modeling is still evolving and obviously we now have more sophisticated artificial intelligence technologies um and frankly just more data is getting collected overall right and NOAA and NASA as well as the DOD itself so talk about what specifically is climate intelligence and what makes it good what makes for good climate intelligence, especially when there are still so many unknowns? Because obviously the, the climate is evolving. Mother Nature is not waiting while we figure out what to do, right? And so it's it's changing every day. And I'm sure there's some kind of algorithm to figure out how it's changing where. But talk about climate intelligence and, and what makes good climate intelligence. Right. Well, when you think of climate intelligence, you have to think of, of the two major factors that affect um, both weather and climate, which is time frames and geographic scales. Right. So when we think of weather, we have reliable weather prediction out in short time frames, you know, a week or so today. But, you know, decades ago, it was only for a few days. Now it's the skill has improved and it's reliable out for uh, about a week now at a local scale. So, you know, the weather here in Washington or the weather in Florida or anywhere around the world. Now, climate models have a are on a different scale. They're on a global scale and they also are out, um, a hundred, you know, 50 to 100 years. What we're trying to do today and what climate intelligence is, is closing that gap between short term weather and long-term global climate to have real-time precision climate intelligence for defense decision-making. Now, every sector of the economy needs it, not just defense. Insurance, transportation, financial sectors, the health sector. We're trying to close some, what we call sometimes that one to 10 year gap to have reliable uh, nearer term climate predictions out more than one week. Some people call it seasonable, seasonal, to sub-seasonal forecasting at a local time scale. What's going to happen in Norfolk, Virginia? You know, what kind of storms does the Navy have to be prepared to deal with in its major military base? Or what level of sea level rise is going to happen in the next one, two, or five years? Or if we're going to prepare for a future war fight uh, in the Pacific, how are ocean conditions and other atmospheric conditions going to change in the near term. Um, so those are the types of improvements that are coming. We call it improved predictive capability or climate intelligence. And that's about stepping down global climate models to local and regional models that give you fidelity uh, at a shorter time frame and are relevant to decision makers in different industries. In defense, we needed to be relevant to war fighters who are planning a military operation or to infrastructure planners who are looking at what uh, what kind of trends or standards do they need to plan the next generation of military infrastructure, installation infrastructure, so that it's resilient uh, out for the next 25 years, for example. Wow, that's really, really helpful. And I can see how any industry, you're right, would benefit from that, especially insurance, but really anywhere, right? I mean, any kind of... I mean, New Orleans, you know, it's getting hit again today. You mentioned Louisiana is getting hit um, again. That there, I can see how then Miami is built, you know, putting houses on stilts now because of sea level rise. So I can see how intelligence, climate intelligence like that could really help urban planners for various communities. 
Absolutely. And it already is. And, and there are already some services that can tell you what the flood risk is likely to be in your area um, over the next, in the coming decades. Now, then you have to make a judgment. Are you willing to buy a house in an area that's likely to be flooded? And what's your likelihood of getting insurance? Um, so there are all these important questions. This is an important field of um, climate intelligence, climate data, and, and decision-making services that is what I, what I also call climate tech. You know, we often think of clean tech as about the energy energy, but there's all this climate information tech that's increasingly important to how we responsibly manage our societies. Yeah, absolutely. I interviewed an executive from AT&T. You may know about their climber model. They developed a model with FEMA and uh, the Department of Energy and Argonne, I should say, National Lab, to uh, be able to predict where uh, what the impact of the climate will likely be on any patch of land, if you will, because they they were tired of losing their own equipment, frankly. So it's a, it's another interesting tool in that climate tech bucket. Um, you mentioned a minute ago, I, I want to just go back to this for a minute, because I think it's really important that people don't think about either, is the impact on... Um, climate of causing or exacerbating geopolitical conflicts um, with political destabilization, et cetera. You mentioned water and, and food insecurities and, and, of course, the cumulative impact when there's repeated events someplace. Um, I think that there's a, a story in your book about how some people link the Syrian conflict, for example, in addition to what their government may have done or not done. There's all there's some triggers around water insecurity, for example, there. But talk a little bit about how um, these kinds of cl uh, climate triggered, if not uh, climate change, but climate triggered uh, situations will can instigate political conflict that can then lead to uh, political unrest or ways that the military and national security may need to step in. Right. Well, as far back as 2007, one of our uh, military advisory board members characterized uh, climate change as a petri dish for terrorism. So let me explain how that happens. It's no, it's not a surprise when you look at a map of the regions of the world most in uh, distress most at risk of, of conflict, weak governance, uh, influx of terrorists, that those are also the areas of greatest climate stress. Climate stress as in most cases being prolonged drought with overlaid with extreme weather events, with weak and fragile societies that have a hard time recovering from any given event. And that occurs mostly across the equatorial regions of the world. Uh, and so as these regions are increasingly subject to weather extremes and prolonged drought, they become vulnerable to terrorist inroads when they can't, uh, communities can't support themselves. Terrorists move in, they provide the opportunities for the young, often male youth that don't otherwise have employment. And then um, they become you know, everyone else in the society becomes subject uh, to their rule, especially when you have weak and fragile governments that can no longer support their people. So we've seen this now across, you know, from Somalia uh, into parts of the burgeoning populations of Mali and Niger and in other regions of the world. So what we need to do is really think about how do you get after the root causes of climate distress and, and terrorism in these areas so that you can provide uh, better livelihoods, better sources of food security. We have major efforts looking at global uh, food at, at food uh, opportunities. Uh, our State Department Special Envoy calls it opportunity crops, sort of rethinking what are the climate resilient crops in the region, looking at new ways of providing water locally uh, so that girls don't have to walk as far to fetch water and then are at risk of either uh, being attacked or don't have time to go to school. So even smaller solar 
powered uh, water stations, wind or water stations, which I've seen in some communities in Southern Africa and Zambia, for example, help provide new opportunities for local communities. Oh, wow, that's really important. And it's interesting, of course, the vulnerabilities to how Hamas took over Gaza come to mind in terms of um, terrorists taking over government of a of an area. Um, but it's it, it, I love that opportunity crops. That's so fascinating. I think it's it sounds like what they're also what the strategy is also to provide economic opportunity, right? To find other ways to provide economic development in those areas right, around the climate distress that or using addressing as you say, a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, maybe using the climate distress situation as an opportunity to create a new way of economic development for that population so that they both solve the problem and have a, have a stronger economy, not just mitigate the weakness. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, a bunch of stories I could talk about. I interviewed a woman in Africa who's doing some of that as well. Um, the one of the other things and this connects to environmental peace building. Um, you know, I I was I had the privilege of receiving a lifetime achievement award this earlier this year from the Environmental Peace Building Association, uh, and that's because I, I've spent a lot of my life trying to forge environmental security cooperation uh, among. Uh, allies and partners and other nations and lift up communities because the military isn't going to be the solution to the climate crisis. It comes in when there is a crisis. Uh, but in the long run, we need to build those uh, sustainable solutions at the, at the local level. And one of the many deep tragedies of the current conflict in the Middle East is um, the halt to what had been a new era of water and energy cooperation uh, among Israel, Jordan, and potentially Palestine exchanging uh, water for energy. Uh, Israel needs uh, more energy. Jordan ha needs more water, has a lot of clean energy and its, its solar capability. Israel um, has carefully managed its national water systems over many years. So now those um, potential agreements will have to wait for uh you know, for a future day, but hopefully there is a, there are opportunities to build a more sustainable set of water and energy infrastructure across this and other regions. Oh, I bet there are. That's fascinating. I didn't know about that. Um, one of the other things, I'll ask you a couple other things and then get some career advice from you for folks, but um, you talked about in the book that climate change produced a different battlefield. And um, uh, I can, obviously, I can give you the quote, but you know your book better than I do, and altering the very physical foundations of the geostrategic landscape. What do you mean by that? How has climate change created a different battlefield? Well, Secretary Leon Panetta, former Secretary of Defense, said, you know, after Superstorm Sandy, when um, we deployed our Navy forces to help, uh, and our Army, all, all, a lot of military, to help uh, rescue and recover in New York City. Uh, the Navy, under the command, uh, Expeditionary Strike Group 2 of uh, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips at the time, uh, one of the early female uh, surface warfare leaders, uh, helped uh, manage the Port of New York when it was knocked out in Superstorm Sandy. Uh, at Sandy Hook and the Coast Guard uh, couldn't operate from there. And the Army Corps of Engineers literally turned the lights back on in New York. So, um, you know, Secretary Panetta and others have looked into a future where you have these very intense, mul perhaps multiple at the same time, um, dis extreme weather events and natural disasters, which could be combined with a cyber attack um, or other deliberate attacks to really um, change the way and, and impair uh, the functioning of whole societies. And so we have to be prepared for that from a domestic homeland security uh, standpoint, but we also have to see that that could be the possibility uh, in a future conflict, a combined climate cyber incident, 
uh, in a Pacific conflict. Uh, so that's why, say, the climate has changed the way we have to operate on the battlefield. And it means that we have to uh, understand those changes, be able to better predict them, and have our forces prepared to operate in and through them. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, these crises do leave the infrastructure vulnerable to a cyber attack, and that's all the more reason to have reduce dependence on a national grid, right? That the the micro grids and the um, uh, small nuclear reactors and things that you talked about a bit ago. Um, you mentioned in the um, last section of your book four recommendations not to leave the problems unsolved, right? Um, so you talk about four central recommendations as you describe them on managing climate change as a threat multiplier. You list them as awareness, adaptation, mitigation, and alliances. So explain those recommendations and where the military and the national security apparatus are on the continuum today of managing those. Yes, well, I think we can move from threat multiplier to an opportunity multiplier using the need to accelerate into the energy transition and decarbonize our op our economy uh, as a way to forge and accelerate into a better future. So the first one we, we talked about a little bit, Joan, which is uh, improving this predictive capability or climate intelligence. That's all about data and having the right information systems and data for defense decisions based on near real term climate near real term uh climate futures the second area is really building res resilience uh into the climate change that it's already baked into our societies because we've already raised temperatures a certain amount we have a certain amount of sea level rise we have ocean warming temperatures we have wildfires, so we have to be able to uh, withstand stronger storms, uh, stronger floods, higher tides, uh, and other different parameters. And that's about making our infrastructure resilient. It's also about making our people resilient. At the end of the day, it's all about the humans in the loop. Uh, and so we have to protect uh, our people from, uh, and this goes for all of society, but especially for those serving in the military from either increased and changing disease vectors, infectious diseases changing. Uh, there's a whole health component to climate change, as well as operating in, in these different temperature extremes. Uh, the third area is about mitigation. That's all about energy, changing our energy systems. We've also talked about how we move towards net zero and transform that. And oh, by the way, it's important to note that the Defense Department is doing this not just for the climate, but for the mission. So we say, you know, mission readiness is climate readiness because it turns out that, for example, hybrid electric vehicles uh, are quieter and they have better torque. So they have advantages over traditional vehicles. And a blended body air wing, a new air wing design will save 30 percent uh, efficiency uh, over existing uh, aircraft design. So there are advantages in moving towards advanced energy and improved efficiency. It gives you more military effectiveness. And then finally, I talk about how we have to reimagine our global cooperation with allies and partners. In every area where we have uh, uh, working with our allies and partners in every region of the world, we need to think about having climate security cooperation that uh, both serves America's interests, but also meets the needs of our allies and partners, some of whom face climate distress as an existential threat. Yeah, and frankly, COVID proved that we can do co-optition too, right? That we can, uh, that when there is a global threat of some kind, that nations uh, can uh, collaborate in ways that haven't happened really before and uh, companies can even can cooperate with their competitors etc to solve collective problems so um hopefully there's a lesson in in that crisis as well for this right yes we can you know as i say sometimes we can walk and chew gum you know we're going to be continually competing with china but in other areas uh we should be ensuring that um there, there is a sufficient amount of sustainable energy uh, 
movement towards a better climate future. Yeah, absolutely. And we can see what they've been doing, right? In some ways, they've been the head of the United States in investing in clean energy technologies, and in some ways, not so much, uh, which is a whole nother conversation we could have sometime. Well, before I let you go, I'd like to get some career advice for mid-career women. Think about women who have maybe 15 years of experience, they have a, an education, they, they know what they're good at, um, they want to excel, they want to make money, they want to advance their career, and they want to make a difference and do not feel that it should have them have to have a trade-off, right? So what advice would you give to them? Ooh, that's a great question, Joan. Uh, I, I sometimes say, you know, you, you, you can have it all, but you can't necessarily have it all at the same time. I mean, you can have a, uh, a good career, a professional career with impact, uh, but not necessarily every moment of it, every particular instance, maybe every assignment, even every job is going to be the perfect one. Uh, and you're also balancing that with your your family and your your family life. It helps very much to have a supportive uh, spouse. I've had one, uh, and you know, to be able to have time to uh, raise your children. I had three young kids when I left the Pentagon. Uh, and then I was part-time for a while when I first started at the Center for Naval Analysis, and then I gradually accepted more responsibilities there uh, as as time went on. And I think it, it helps to uh, diversify uh, what you do in your career. And also I find sometimes women undersell themselves. They think they have to have all sorts of competencies, competencies in order to be qualified for that next level of career advancement. Uh, but I think, and and sometimes people say, well, men, you know, will, will say they're ready when they're not, women hold themselves back. You know, that that is certainly an overgeneralization, but I would say uh, that you have to be willing to sort of put yourself out there a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, don't be afraid for people to tell you no, or you can't go that way, or find out another way to work around it. And also, I'd say that um, the network really matters. So even if you do take time off, um, you know, or, or it's time back to sort of have more family time and you step back from your professional life at a certain stage and then you think you want to get back in, don't let your network, your, your relationship network atrophy uh, because that always is vitally important. At the end of the day, it's it's all about people. I tell the story sometimes about my dad. Uh, who worked for uh, IBM most of his career. And he used to say to me, Sherry, it's all about the network. And even though my dad worked for a technology company, he wasn't particularly computer savvy, but he was really good with people. And uh, he was very good um, at maintaining his, his relationship network. And that's something he taught me. And I think that's important. And then women have to um, coach and advise the next generation of women. I do a lot of that in my career, a lot. Um, I didn't have any female mentors when I was coming up, but now I, I feel like that's, uh, you know, that's important. I want to give back um, and I want to enable the next uh, generation to sort of see where they can go. Oh, that's perfect. That's all good stuff. And you've obviously, I mean, you've collected your network over all these years in national security and defense and and built on it, a lot of those folks are in your book, right? So Exactly, um, and a lot of women leaders too. Yes, I, absolutely. I did notice that you uh, referenced Tony Zinni, General Zinni, a bunch, and I had the privilege of getting to know him um, a few years ago. I was in the National Press Club um, Speakers Committee, and and he, he had a book coming out, and we had a really interesting, it kind of dovetails with what you're talking about too, which is, makes sense of why you have them in your book, but he talked a lot about uh, peace building as well as exactly uh, when, you, when you go in, when you're dealing with a conflict situation, you don't just look at solving the conflict, but you look at the next steps and the, look exactly. at it holistically, mm -hmm. which is a Very lot of much what so. you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. Any final thoughts before I let you get back to your life? 
Well, thank you very much, Joan, for having me on. I, I hope your uh, listeners will enjoy Threat Multiplier and uh, also see the opportunity multiplier that we can create as we accelerate into a more sustainable future. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today on Electric Ladies Podcast. Sherry Goodman, author of Threat Multiplier, Climate, Military Leadership, and Global Security. Um, and thank you, Sherry, for all that you've done and all you continue to do to keep the country and the planet safe. Um, your work is extraordinary. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joan. You're welcome. So what did you hear today that surprised you about climate change as a national security issue? Do you want to explore how uh, some of these issues affect your world or is anybody in your family in, in the military or in national security Post it to us on Twitter and threads at Joan Michelson. Send us any questions as well. You may win a complimentary 30-minute coaching session with me. I've met some wonderful people that way. Um, and please subscribe to our mailing list to stay abreast of our amazing guests like Sherry, our articles, and career support. You can subscribe on electricladiespodcast.com. I'm Joan Michelson. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.